you'll see each level requires a step of growth and that's referring to a child's reading ability. Here you see the phrase teachers create more time and space and then you see close and careful reading. There it is, close and careful reading and then being able to provide for our students who are struggling, for students who are reading below level, how can we scaffold and support those students so that they're not at a disadvantage. Close reading is a term that's associated with high quality text, complex text. And I just want to make this differentiation right now. This does not mean that everything is thrown out and all you do is focus in on complex text. Everything you've learned so far in all of your education classes out in the field still holds true. But there's one added component. And if you can think back to when you did your English regions, um, you did not know what was going to be on that test. You may have got to a point with the passage, you thought, oh man, I really, I don't understand this at all. Because it was a complex passage. This close reading strategy is actually a new and additional strategy that we need to be teaching students. All right? And all of my years as a teacher, in, mostly in literacy, up until last summer, I had never heard that term, close reading. I had heard close, C-L-O-Z-E, but not close. So it is a strategy specifically designed for attacking more difficult text. All right, so kind of keep that in mind. Don't think everything a student needs to do needs to be more difficult, but they do need to be exposed to this. And the new commissioner of New York State, um, Dr. King, has challenged New York State teachers to do one piece of complex text in the spring, and that he also challenged us to do one piece last fall. All right, just one lesson with a complex piece of text to kind of get this ball rolling in New York State. Any questions so far? All right, Lexiles. Anyone have an idea of what they have to do with? Okay, Lexiles are the equivalent of a readability measure. Okay, you've heard of readability. So um, the old Lexiles are listed in the middle and I'll use my fancy pointer that the teacher center gave me. So these are the old Lexiles, which basically now we can kind of forget about. And these are the new Lexiles that are going to be necessary for students to have exposure to if they're going to be successful with these more complex texts. So you can see, for example, in the two, three grades band, the Lexile started at 450, and that's just a, a Lexile measurement. The more important thing is that you equate it to a grade span. Going up to 725. Well, 2, 3 still start at 450, but now it's going up to 790. So the implication is by the end of third grade, students should have more exposure to this end. Now, you'll notice 790 previously fell 
here in the four or five grade span. Okay? And now, all right, so you can see how things have shifted. This stands for college and career ready. So by the end of the 11th, 12th grade span, the expectation is students will be reading. And this span is actually end of uh, uh, grade 12. And this actually equates to 13 plus, which would be a freshman in college plus. Okay. So, Charlotte's Web, which forever and a day was in the four or five grade span, now with the new Lexiles falls in the two three grade span. The narrative life of Frederick Douglass, one of my all time favorite people, um, has shifted from the nine ten grade span and is now in the six eight grade span. I want to make a note too. Look at your copyright dates. The idea here is it's not an adapted version, it's the original version. All right? Now, the narrative life of Frederick Douglass, which I um, did many years with some of my students. I did a couple of chapters. I always did the adapted version. Now, if I had to do it over now, I certainly would use the original version. But even in the adapted version, there's language of the time. Um, there's one point in time where uh, Frederick's master tells his wife, who was actually teaching Frederick how to read, she gets caught doing this. She doesn't realize that it's um, wrong because he married somebody from the North. And she was a teacher in the North. But he says, if you give an, a slave an inch, he'll take an L, E-L-L. -L. Now, we don't have that word anymore in the English language. And it strictly was a term that referred to, it was somewhere almost a yard. They didn't use the term yard in the 1800s. It was L as a unit of measurement. So you begin to see, you know, this exposure to language of the time period is very important. And then here, this is for middle and high school. These are some of the text exemplars that are expected in the middle school. The preamble and the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. There's an art uh, biography of Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, music, all right. And then math for high school in numeracy. This is actually based on the work of Archimedes and some of his original work on math. Science, look at Scientific American. There is a push toward using more journals. And then even for technology, um, some of the um, computer jargon uh, that even in a computer class or in any class, a student could, uh, a teacher could make use of some of these kind of how-to books. And all of these are in Appendix B of the new Common Core. Okay, if you're interested in looking, and there's actually samples of them in there as well what the actual language looks like and sounds like as it reads. So when you think of levels of meaning, you might have something that's a very simple piece of text, but the symbolism is very deep. That also uh, plays into text complexity. Your um, quant quantitative has to do with the actual readability, and then being able to match the reader to the text and the tag. So, for example, Grapes of Wrath, which many of you probably read in grade school, actually is lexiled. I think it's the fifth or sixth grade reading level. Well, the Grapes of Wrath is not appropriate for a fifth or sixth grader to be reading. The content is quite sophisticated. So even that is balanced out when you're talking about complex pieces of text. So it's not only the readability, 
it has to do with the levels of meaning that are embedded in the piece of text, and it has to do with um, the sophistication of the content, and is it appropriate for certain age groups. All right? Underneath, and it's broken down K5, and then the, the, toward the back it's uh, 612, you'll see the ranges of stories, dramas, poetry, literary, nonfiction, and historical, scientific, all right, what those genres are. So you'll see with informational text for K through 5, we have everything from biographies to technical text, which, be, which also includes directions, informations and graph charts, digital sources, on the next page, you'll see a chart. The left-hand side has to do with literature and what some of the recommended pieces of text are. The right-hand side has to do with those informational text. And just look at the copyright dates, all right, that are there. You can begin to see there is a wide range of time periods that are covered. And that really is done on purpose. We have, um, over the past 10 years, there was a very strong movement to do more contemporary literature because it was considered uh, literature that students could easily relate to. So a lot of the classics were kind of pushed aside and more contemporary uh, realistic fiction was embedded in the curriculum. Now we know there's a trend going back the other way. Also um, enclosed is a chart about staying on topic within a grade and across grades. So you'll notice the human body is here and then some recommended informational text spanning K through 5. So this is also, you begin to see there's more of this thematic approach where in kindergarten you would begin talking about the human body. And even though it might not be in the science content for second or third grade, you can see that it builds from one year to the next with more complex concepts being introduced. And this is an example that they give teachers to begin thinking about that kind of approach in schools. And then behind that you see the 6 through 12. And once again the text complexity pieces stay the same, very consistent throughout. You'll see the genres become more sophisticated. All right? Going from um, Allegories and parodies and satire, graphic novels have become very big to the nonfiction pieces, which are essays or speeches or opinion pieces or memoirs of an author. All right? And then once again on the next page, you have those samples of quality text, complex pieces of text that actually um, teachers in the field are actually using some of these now as a place to start because they're given in the new Common Core. And Appendix B has excerpts from each of these and also um, sample performance tasks. So I'm trying to re give you an example. Charlotte's Web, one of the performance tasks would be to compare the point of view of Wilbur with the point of view of Fern with the point of view of the narrator. Now currently, it's very typical to discuss what was Wilbur's point of view, just dealing with one character. Now it's always multiple, comparing multiple things. All right, compare and contrast, very important. Okay? So this will be a little reference guide for you. This is right in um, the Common Core 
after uh, each set of standards, you will see this right in there, okay? All right, your next shift, text-based answers. 80% of what we ask students now should be text-based questions. These are questions where students go right back into the text, find the answers in one place, or having to find clues to the answers in multiple places in order to come up with the correct answer. 20% can still be questions like, um, how do you think, how would you think Wilbur felt when? All right? So that what do you think kinds of questions are really being de-emphasized the text-based questions are where it's at in the new Common Core. Oh, went too fast again. Okay, writing from sources. Um, in this particular, if you kind of skim through there, you'll see emphasize use of evidence to inform or make an argument rather than a personal narrative. Narrative is still important, it says, but they would rather have students develop those skills through written arguments. So, there is definitely a movement away from opinion writing or um, explaining what, what I did over my summer vacation. Definitely a movement away from that because for college and career, once you get to college, nobody really cares about what you think in your writing. You are mostly doing kind of research-related writing. All right? So, and this information is in Appendix A. By the end of grade four, 65% of what students are asked to write should be that more analytic writing, where students are asked to, you know, defend an argument or explain something. 35% can be those personal experiences. By the end of eighth grade, that goes up to 70%, where 70% is analytic, 30% personal experience, and then, by the time a student gets to 12th grade, 80% should be analytic writing, 20% more of the, the conveying a personal experience. So you can see how that begins to um, increase in importance so that when a, a student enter, enters college and career, they are really um, writing on this more research-related type of information. Now, when you say research, research begins in kindergarten. And in the new core, one example of an activity would be reading a children's book, actually reading two or three children's books by the same author, and asking students, asking those little kindergarten guys and gals, what clues tell you that these three stories are written by the same author? Are there words or phrases the author tends to, to use? Does the author use the same kind of illustrations? You can also do it with illustrators, looking at um, three different pieces of text where the same illustrator was used. And no, they can't actually write about that yet, but they certainly can have those discussions. And you can begin to see students are really looking for details in the text. They're looking for details from what they've listened to, being able to pick that out. 
So that's an example of a very um, initial type of research project. Um, as they move up at the end of third grade, there is um, an activity where they read multiple books on a single topic and do some kind of a report comparing two or three versions on the same topic. And then, of course, by the time they get to middle school, they talk about short and more sustained research that requires synthesizing information from multiple resources. In fact, the recommendation from this PARC consortium is that students every 10 weeks should be encountering a, in some kind of research project. All right, every 10 weeks, every quarter, which is um, now, uh, now we do some research in school, but definitely when we say every quarter, that's pretty intensive, every quarter to do some kind of a, an in-depth in -depth research uh, type of activity. Yes? Um, just when you're mentioning that, so if you're talking at the high school level, could could grade level teachers get together and coordinate and say this quarter is going to be the science, this quarter is going to be social studies? Absolutely. Because in order for the common core to be delivered, it's not just the elementary classroom teacher, it is not just the ELA teacher when you get to the secondary level. Your art and your music and even your phys ed teacher can be part of this. A single teacher cannot do it all. It's way too much. So the thrust is interdisciplinary and yes, get together across the grade level. Who can do what? Who naturally can do what within a curriculum? And those reading and writing strands can be achieved throughout all those areas. So that's a very good point. Any other questions? All right, the last is academic vocabulary. And academic vocabulary, when you skim down through that explanation, you'll see build vocabulary to access grade level complex text. All right? So academic vocabulary is going to be one avenue that students can be successful in trying to break down more difficult pieces of text. And I'm going to explain what that means. All right. How many of you have seen or heard of tiered vocabulary? Okay. Somewhat familiar. Tiered vocabulary um, has been around, I'd say, about 10 years. And there's three levels. The first level is your general vocabulary. And this really is vocabulary. As students enter a grade level, you would expect them to have. This is the vocabulary that they you know, have conversations with their friends in or they use in, in dis class discussions. Very natural kinds of vocabulary. Tier one vocabulary doesn't need to be taught because the students have internalized the meaning of that. Then I'm going to skip down to tier three. Tier three is really vocabulary very specific to a certain component of a content, of a domain. All right? So, you know, the aorta would be a vocabulary word, you know, that might be associated with a circulatory system or in a bigger domain, the heart. Um, types of technical vocabulary, uh, the authors of the Common Core recommend that if we're giving students complex pieces of text to read, that we need to give them the meaning of those. Whether it's orally or if they're going to be doing more independent work, we would actually, on the side, you would give them that definition. And even on the state assessments, if there is a particular piece of uh, vocabulary or a phrase that would be unfamiliar to students, there's a little asterisk near it. And 
even on the state assessments, they give you what that means. Okay, so this is very uh, parallel to that. And I'm just going to mention one little hint here because as a teacher, I feel it's very important. No research supports having students look up words in a dictionary and write out the definition. That is least effective. It's a waste of time. All right? It's more effective for the teacher to give them the vocabulary, give them the definition, because as teachers, we just can't say the definition. We'll explain it more. So that has more um, uh, bearing trying to get this terminology and long-term memory than having students look up the word in the dictionary and write out the definition. And then we have tier two vocabulary is called specialized and academic vocabulary falls under tier two vocabulary. And this vocabulary is vocabulary that students will see in multiple contexts across different contents and is considered to be worth spending some time on. So for example, that word layer could be referring to a layer cake. It could be referring to fashion, dressing in layers. It could be referring to layers of sedimentary rock in science or even the layers of the, um, the earth, the core and the mantle and so on. So that is considered to be words that have multiple meanings depending on their context is really considered to be um, the focus of academic vocabulary. They're considered to be high utility words which just means their usability is uh, warrants that they're worth spending some time on for their meaning. Now, in order to do academic vocabulary, <coughs> teachers must, 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 must give kids strategies for attacking academic vocabulary. So on these complex pieces of text, when it comes to the assessment, students aren't going to have time to, uh, you know, Google what a word means. There will be words they encounter that they're going to have to try and figure out. And the strategy, one strategy, is using words in context strategies. And um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with some of these words in context strategies. If you Google them, you'll get many different names of what they're called, but basically this is what they are about. So a direct explanation or a definition occurs within a, uh, when sentences within a paragraph explain the meaning or give the definition immediately following an unknown word or phrase. Okay? Sometimes there's even a comma or a hyphen or a set of parentheses that the definition is directly stated there. So if you look at this example, Magna Carta is the vocabulary phrase. King John was forced to sign the Magna Carta. There's a comma there. That's what it literally means. And then the following sentence explains it further. So looking at that, students have an idea using the context. It really doesn't matter at this point if they can pronounce Magna Carta. That's not important. The only thing they really need to know is what the meaning is. Another context strategy has to do with training students to look for antonym clues. And I've seen classrooms where there's a chart up and some of these words that are appropriate for that grade level are there. Whenever you see but, even though, however, yet, on the other hand, it tells you an opposite idea is coming. All right? So the example. 
The students in my first period class were very quiet, but by the time they attended the assembly ninth period, they were very boisterous. So boisterous would be the unknown word. We have but in there, which kind of, doesn't kind of, it actually tells us that an opposite meaning are, is coming. All right, so but, very quiet, the opposite, boisterous, you would um, make the assumption that it has something to do with loud. Another one, words in a list. All right, it does not matter, once again, if students can pronounce this, all right, what really matters with complex pieces of text is that, ah, a grackle, it's got to be some kind of a bird in North Carolina. That's all that a student needs in order to get meaning out of that sentence. Um, and then the last one is definitely the more difficult one, all right, that word jetties you have to infer the information, infer the clues. So in here, miles of shoreline are disappearing. Large storms at high tides and rising sea levels cause beach erosion. Jetties and seawalls are only temporary solutions and are often not effective for the long term. So you don't need to know how to pronounce it, but once you came to that J word and you wanted to know what the meaning was, Look at that. There are words and phrases that would give the student an idea of what a jetty was. Can someone offer one clue there? One context clue, one word or phrase that would give students meaning? Anyone? Just. Solutions, Solutions might be, yeah. Another one? What would be the purpose of, a, of, of this J word? Shorelines OK, very good. Shoreline disappearing. Another hand over here. Well, you know, with something like a sea, you, you see law. Very, once again, yes. If they had a knowledge of compound words here, you see a wall. Well, that word wall is in there. That gives you a clue. Um, erosion might give you a clue, all right? And then the solution, all right? So all these are found in different parts that would give students a clue to the meaning. Now, this doesn't just happen for students. These are things that need to be directly taught and then applied immediately to a piece of text. So they actually have practice looking for this. Understanding of multiple meaning words, all right? Some of them include things like this, where you have a bank. What kind of a bank is it? Is it a snow bank, a river bank, left bank? Uh, expressions, don't bank on it. A lot of students don't ha have knowledge of some of these expressions. Uh, a bank of clouds, what are the differences between? And then, of course, words like, is it close or is it close? Is it receiving a present or is it presenting information? All right. Students, once again, need to be t directly taught that. So as they're reading, they can adjust, oh, this isn't close, this is close. All right. And then knowledge of roots and affixes. This is resurging in schools. So if, for example, a fourth grader on a state assessment was reading something that was taken from like a health uh, magazine and they, they see this H-Y-P-O-D-E-R-M-I-C word, they don't recognize the word. All right, they might, if somebody said hypodermic, they go, oh yeah. But when they first um, see this word, they can begin to break it down. So if they had been taught hypo, always means under. Derm has to do with the skin. They can begin to understand what a, that kind of a needle is. All right. Once again, they don't really need to know how to pronounce it. One other thing I want to mention with complex text is, especially at the elementary level, 
Fluency really is not important with complex pieces of text because even as adults, even reading it silently, you would not be reading it fluently. If it was at a level that was at or above where you're reading, you would actually kind of, you'd be stopping and you'd be going back to reread and reread because you'd have to for your flow of meaning. So with complex text, fluency is really downplayed and this kind of analysis is definitely more important. Now, um, they recommend Latin and Greek roots and affixes. Does anyone know why knowledge of especially Latin roots and affixes really is key to understanding a lot of vocabulary? This is a little history lesson. You know? Not really. Well, we were just saying that it's like Latin is the root of most of like, the English. That's right. Latin is the source of all the Romance languages. The Romance languages are basically the languages of the Western world. And Latin was the language of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire spanned Western Asia, all of Europe, and Northern Africa. That was the universal language. And all these languages in their vernacular stem from those Latin roots. So that's why um, that's so important. Um, in a little side note here, my son and daughter-in-law live in Charlotte, North Carolina. And five years ago, there was a Latin school that opened up, K through 12. There's a waiting list by grade level to get in there. And the tuition is $20,000 a year. But can you imagine starting in kindergarten all the way up through grade 12, what your knowledge of language, I mean, you basically could probably translate any language in the Western, in the Western world, you know. It's kind of mind-boggling. All right. All right, you do have, I did provide for you a little... Um, and let's see, it is white, and it says um, my name and then the vocabulary strategy resource packet. On this front page, it has what I just did an overview for you for samples for words and context. In the back, the top half of the sheet touches on the multiple meaning words and the roots and affixes. And then <clears throat> I also added, as a teacher in the field, two other pieces I feel are very valuable. The word origins, for whatever it's worth. Sometimes doing a little bit of research in some of these phrases is important. So if you look at that word flea market, we still use that today, hundreds of years later. And to think that that began during the Middle Ages, during the Black Plague, that term came from the markets and the rats and the um, fleas that were infesting everyone with this disease. And we still use flea market today. So introducing some words and phrases, if they're appropriate, with their origin, students never, ever forget it. All right? It kind of stays with them. And then the analogies at the bottom. Students really have to dig deep to understand the relationship. So for example, it says this is an ancient civilization piece. This is in the sixth grade curriculum. Egypt is to the Nile. So they'd have to recognize ancient is an ancient Egypt as an ancient civilization that it grew up along the Nile River as Sumer, the Sumerians were another ancient civilization, as and what river did that civilization spring up against. So they always need to do know the relationship. As a teacher, these are kind of hard to come up with at first, but definitely they make the students think because they do have to stop and always know what the relationship is between the, the first pair. Okay? So this is just a little resource for you um, as you um, embark on your student teaching.
So just kind of wrap this up. Words in context, very important. I can't say that enough. Very important. Multiple meaning words, important because you've got to combine multiple meaning with the words in context to really get the correct meaning. Figurative language, if you are an ELA, you know those metaphors, uh, the similes. Even in speeches, a uh, kind of figurative language is rhetoric and words that are repeated over and over and over again are important. In the President's State of the Union speech, there was a word he repeated over and over and over again. It was the word fair, fair, fairness, all throughout his speech. That having students begin to understand words that are repeated generally are key to the meaning of the piece. So that's another. And then common roots and affixes I feel are very, very important, but I think in schools we're at different levels. Um, starting in kindergarten, teachers across to grade level, what are some common base words that we have? What are some common prefixes that we tend to use? The prefix UN always means not, undo, unhappy, all right? Teaching even in kindergarten, when you see that, it means un means not. They can begin to break apart some uh, vocabulary. So this is a little um, kind of a rule of thumb. I've seen things similar to this on classroom walls. All right. When you come to an unfamiliar word, what do you do? You don't shut down. You go, oh, this is what I need to do. Context clues, all right? Look at your word parts, then go back and look at the context again. Can I figure out the word? Now, we also have in your packet this uh, academic vocabulary tip sheet. I believe it's the goldenrod color. There is no magic formula for picking out academic vocabulary. No matter where I go, teachers are asking, well, you, do you have these academic vocabulary list? Well, yes, there's thousands of them. And as teachers, you cannot focus in on thousands of academic vocabulary. So how, what do you focus in on? Well, looking at this, underneath, you'll see how do you decide which words to teach. I want you to take a minute, skim through those, and know any words or phrases that help teachers begin to focus in on certain words or eliminate certain words. <coughs> 